Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the Surge Podcast. So, uh, for today, I figured I'd talk about uh, low velocity penetrating hand injuries. Um, we all have a, a friend, a friend of the family, etc., who's had one of these things. And, uh, you know, it, it's always interesting when you do a review of the literature because, by and large, uh, I'm not an expert at hand surgery or anything like that. Quick disclaimer. What we end up seeing when it comes to low velocity injuries are either crushed hands, which are mainly an orthopedic issue, or if they're penetrating hand injuries, it's either a dog bite, a human bite, a cat bite, or an avogado attack. Now, in general, no normal animal will attack unprovoked, especially a pet, especially a well treated pet, especially a well treated bit pet with normal human beings around. If you have that happening in your house, there must be something wrong. Either you don't know how to treat your pet, which I would say is the vast majority of cases for domesticated animals, or your pet's going through some issues, and you should probably listen to them. Now, from the patient's perspective, uh, human and humans versus dogs versus cats versus rats versus monkeys, by and large, human bites are the filthiest. You are filthy, filthy human beings. There is no question there. Um, when you look at the cases reported all around the world, uh, in terms of human uh, bites, HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and herpes simplex are primarily transmitted by human beings. And, you know, not only are they primarily transmitted, but the, these are these are heavy infections. They have a heavy burden on you. And, when you look at dogs, cat, r- bats, raccoons, skunks, cats, etc., they tend to transmit rabies, rhabdoverde. Uh, rats and mice can transmit the hantavirus, and monkeys will transmit simian B. The good news is, uh, rhabdoverde, hantavirus, and simian B, even hepatitis B, C, and HIV, you can live with these conditions, and, and there's a fairly good treatment for them. Cross sectionally, right? Single dogs are the most likely culprits, okay, by 70%. And you're more likely to get bit in your hand than anywhere else. However, when you examine the fine print of the data, most of the time, these single dogs have not been treated very well. Uh, There's a ladder of aggression uh, with both humans and animals. And in terms of animals, you know, once you see a dog's ears back, there's something wrong. There's something that's making them uncomfortable. And, you know, kids being kids, it could be something that the kid has done inadvertently, like pulled the dog's tail. It could be something a little bit more. It could be something inherent to the dynamic within the house. It could even be the fact that the dog is lonely and is not being treated well in terms of their basic needs for exercise, for playtime, for walking around. These things can have an impact. You know, they will snap. Uh, you know, I've been in households where, and I love dogs, which, so it breaks my heart, but I've been in households where I've seen dogs and cats being put in small pens for most of the day, if not all, the whole day. You can't do that. You can't expect a healthy, normal pet and an enjoyable family dynamic with your pet if you're putting them in solitary confinement, Right? You need to treat them with respect. You need to avoid running and screaming around them. They don't like to be surprised. Let the dog sniff you before you start interacting. Let them engage with you, right? Use a leash when out in public uh, because you never know where the distractors are and the dogs get used to it, right? Don't ever try and restrict the dog's movements. Don't leave a child alone with a dog because both of them are still learning. Um, You know, try not to humanize a dog too much. So you can do it from time to time when the dog's lived with you for a while i know that that says not to do it at all but you know i would say if if you know your dog well enough and if they're really a part of the family humanizing them is not not a bad thing right and there are certain breeds that are just bad right so uh pit bull terriers have a high level of aggression by bad i mean a high level of aggression very hard to domesticate okay it's the same thing with cats there are certain breeds of cats that are almost impossible to domesticate right and you really have to take care of these things because in some jurisdictions, you will go to prison because your dog misbehaves. Now, when you talk about the surgical aspect of things, the good news is that dog bites are usually very superficial and 
other transmissible diseases are extremely low-level infections that are very easy to treat with a course of antibiotics. Cat bites are slightly deeper. They lead to more surgeries, okay? And they involve more orthopedic surgeries and reconstructions because uh, they have very pointed edges of their teeth, whereas dogs are slightly blunter. They tend to cause slash wounds, right? Uh, humans uh, are the perfect weapon. Um, it, when they bite you, they're filthy, filthy things. And they're very good at getting into joints uh, with their tensor bites. The, humans are, by and large, going to get into your joints and bones quicker just because they have the perfect combination of jaw strength and uh, the ability to latch on with a, a very pointed surface area, right? Um, in terms of human bites, uh, it's mainly staph species that we tend to grow. So, you know, even on the anaerobic side, they're very few and far between. They're very rare. Uh, dogs tend to have more of a pastorella thing going, as do cats, but that just reflects the um, the biome of the mouth, right? The the oral gut biome. In terms of how we treat these things, it's like any other condition, whether you're a vet or a doctor. Uh, identify the source. Identify whether it's a high risk source or a low risk source for rabies, HIV, HPV, HCV. The timing and the location of the injury, any risk factors such as diabetes, uh, splenectomy, cirrhosis, elderly, alcoholism. Uh, ask them if they've been on any recent antibiotics and their immunization history. Evaluate the size and the depth of the wound. Wash it out. Remove any devitalized tissue. Check that the patient has good pulses and is neurologically intact. And do an x-ray just to make sure that there's no air trapped under, uh, there's no penetration to deeper structures or any orthopedic situations. Have an orthopedics workup if you think that there's a joint communication. Don't try and do it yourself in the ED. Sometimes those things don't go well. Um, order an ESR, CRP, and white count. Usually, initially, they're not very indicative, but you need a baseline to follow it up. Copious irrigation, initially. Uh, try and do a delayed closure of the wound. Don't, I wouldn't close them early on. And uh, I would give a short course of antibiotics, depending on the source, the clinical judgment, risk factors, etc., and have the first follow-up happen 24 hours, the next follow-up in about two or three days, and then the follow-up after that in a week. And usually the issue is resolved by then. Um, there's an increased risk of infection when there's a lymphovascular compromise, and those patients should ideally be admitted, especially if there's a crush injury, of course. They should be treated like any other crush injury with serial CKs done, etc. First line antibiotics are comoxiclav, clindamycin, doxycycline, penicillin K, take your pick. Sometimes some people like to use uh, fluoroquinones. I'm not a big fan. Um, similar antibiotics can be used in children. Pregnant women, uh, the current recommendation is azithro uh, for about a week. In general, in general, when I was first trained, we gave whole hog immunotherapy and vaccines. So we gave the immunoglobulin and the vaccine. And then we were told to consider giving the immunoglobulin and the vaccine. Now we're told that in low-risk domesticated uh, cats and dogs with a history of vaccination, we no longer give neither the uh, globulin nor the vaccine. However, my biggest problem, by and large, the growing pandemic, as sensitive as that word is, is avogado attacks. Destoning an avogado is probably going to be the number one reason why you land in the hospital someday, I'm convinced. 49,000 cases reported over about 15 years in the US alone. Uh, the cases are going up with demand for avogados. Uh, these types of knife injuries are typically nasty. They tend to go to the operating room. Uh, there's oftentimes digits that are lost. You can lose the palm. You can even use your leg as you panic and drop the damn thing. Uh, you know, it's it's a hideous, hideous disease, this new issue of the killer avogado. I think that part of it is that there's a, a lack of safety in trying to depit an avogado, get rid of the stone or the seed, call it what you will. And part of it is that avogados are a very aggressive uh, fruit. Uh, they're not the right thing to eat. You know, I like my guacamole, but not enough to fight with this guy. In general, avogado injuries can be avoided by just simply doing the right thing, uh, cutting the avogado open on a table and destoning it on the table itself, either by cutting it into quarters or otherwise. When they do happen, they're the same as any other bite. Irrigate and debride. Perform early follow-up. Perform delayed closure. 
tetanus, yes. Rabies, no, obviously. I was just joking about that. Antibiotics, not really so much. And remember, in this particular situation, the rising star is the avocado, right? So avoid avocados at all costs. Uh, if you need some guacamole, send somebody else to do it for you. This is Saud Al-Zaid. Uh, thank you for listening. Let me know your comments below and please subscribe.